and I applied for school. <clears throat> and when I applied for school, I applied for medical school in the States. So ND school and DO school. Uh, and I also applied for international school. So that's the Caribbean, um, Tel Aviv and Israel is where I actually ended up going. Um, Dublin, Ireland, there's one. I think there's one in the UK. There's one all, you know, all over Europe, China, India. A lot of really great programs. Just because it's international doesn't mean it's not a good program. Um, so I applied to be going in two years from the point I was applying. And one program in Israel called the Sacco School of Medicine, uh, which is affiliated with the state of New York and is like kind of a halfway school. It's kind of international, but also kind of a state school. They uh, responded and said, listen, we have a spot that just opened up. Do you want to come in a few days? And I was like, whoa, that's crazy. So I did. I went and I uh, loved it. I wouldn't trade it for the world. If you asked me if I wanted to go to Harvard and said, I'd say no, because it was an amazing experience. Um, and it was from there I applied to residency. So now I'm in Long Island, New York, and I'm doing a residency, a combined residency. So they've come out with like double programs. So I'm doing a combined residency in internal medicine, which is the treatment of adult patients, as well as pediatrics, which is the treatment of kiddos. So, uh, you know, some of you might be wondering what's the difference between that and family medicine. Family medicine is more outpatient in a clinic. People are not as sick. Med peds is more about, uh, you can also do clinic work, but it's more about uh, a better training with in, inside the hospital um, with really sick patients, uh, ICU patients. And uh, unlike family medicine, we do not get, um, training in obstetrics and gynecology. So don't ask me how to deliver a baby. I don't know how to do that anymore. I did it once in med school and I won't do it again. Um, so yeah, I'm here in my, going to my third year out of four. So I'm a senior resident um, and hopefully gonna go into critical care adult medicine after this. Um, so I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I have a passion for medical education. I love mentoring people going into the healthcare field. I love people who have a positive vibe. I don't think you have to be the smartest person, the most intelligent person in the world to be a doctor. I think you just have to be a hard worker. I think you have to know what you like. I think you have to be socially adept, know how to interact with people. And I think you have to have a, a good, caring, compassionate personality. Um, and ultimately, I was never the top of my class. And I don't think you have to be. I think you just have to work hard, work smart, know how to study. And most importantly, you have to manage your time really appropriately. Um, so I would like to open the floor up. Um, there's only 31 of you here. So if you guys want to throw your questions in the chat, or I don't know if McKenna wants to announce them, I'm, I'm happy to do that. Uh, I want to answer your, answer your guys' personal questions first, because um, I'm here for you guys. And then I'm sure that those questions will apply to the rest of you as well. So it's not um, totally selfish to do that. And then... Um, if there's still time, then we can go over a case and talk about a patient I saw. Um, okay, so any questions? Let's see here, I'll open the chat. I don't think I saw anything pop up. Uh, people from Bay Area, Los Angeles, California. Nice, nice, nice. What questions do you guys have? Do you have no questions for me? Um, I have a question, I'll start us off. Okay. Can we talk about like, really like more in depth of the, international schooling and all that like if there was something that really made you want to do that because I know you said you wouldn't go back and change it but is there something that was very different about it that really pulled you that direction yeah totally I mean I think um the big thing that pulled me there was the fact that they said you can come in a few days and start your journey towards being a doctor rather than waiting for two years that was a huge part of it um but ultimately um uh, you know, I had a great experience. I learned another language. I experienced another culture, the food, the people. And it was such an amazing time. And I'm now considering even going back and just practicing medicine over there because I enjoyed the, the place so much and the people. Um, but as far as like uh, going to residency, it is a little bit more difficult to get into a, um, a residency program. Um, but it's not nearly impossible at all. It's, it's totally probable and, um, it's, uh, not, um, uh, too different than if you were applying from a U.S. school, you just have to, you know, get good grades, get good letters, uh, shadow, um, or rather do rotations in the States if you can get to know people, um, do research and just like kind of, uh, you know, be the best looking student you can be. 
um, which is essentially what you'd be doing in the US anyway. And at the end of the day, USMD, USDO, and then international medical graduates, we can all be all kinds of doctors. I know international graduates that have been neurosurgeons. I know international graduates that have gone into Harvard for residency. Um, it's not uh, unheard of at all. Um, it just is all dependent on one, your connections, two, how good of a student you are, and three, how hard you're willing to work. All right, Lindia Walker, could you expand more on the internal medicine aspect of your residency? Okay, so internal medicine is the study of adults and the treatment of adults. And ultimately, um, that means literally anything short of surgery, I would say. We can treat everyone short of surgery, I would say. Um, now, there are specialties within adult care as well. Um, like if you want me to scope your GI tract and look through your colon, I have to go get specialty training for that, right? I can't just do that out of a residency. I have to go and be a gastroenterologist in fellowship. Um, and there's a lot of specialties outside of internal medicine, cardiology, pulmonology, nephrology, critical care, endocrinology. There's tons and tons of specializations you can go down that you can't practice just with internal medicine. Internal medicine is kind of a gate that you open up to all these other avenues. But if you're like me, I enjoy general medicine and I enjoy doing a little bit of everything and only calling a consultant specialist who went into one of those fields if I need it. I'd rather kind of do it on my own. And I enjoy that um, taking like full grasp of my patient's care. Um, so that's why I'm staying in it. I'm, I'm, I'm potentially going into critical care, which is essentially general medicine on steroids. Right. You're, you're dealing with vent not literally steroids, but. You're dealing with kids on or, or people on ventilators, uh, fixing their blood pressure with um, um, uh, like vasopressors and ionotropes. Uh, you are also, you know, giving sedatives, um, propofol, midazolam, et cetera. Um, so that's a little bit more exciting to me. And it, it involves a lot of kind of aspects of medicine. Um, and I can take kind of full control of my patient, which I really enjoy. Um, so pediatrics is very much the same, except you're just treating kids and there's different diseases, different pathologies. And there's also pretty much the same um, specialties that you can go into out of pediatrics. And, you know, uh, kids have different diseases than adults, but ultimately a lot of the physiology is similar to some degree. So there's a lot of crosstalk, which is why family med and med peds makes a lot of sense, right? Because we're seeing an adult uh, or rather a pediatric patient into adulthood. So we understand kind of the physiology and the evolution of their bodies over time. And that's why we can better treat diseases that start in pediatric you know, childhood and move on to adulthood, right? Like cystic fibrosis, diabetes, uh, cardiac diseases. That's what makes MedPeds docs really um, versatile and um, uh, valuable because we're able to see the, we get training in those pediatric diseases that are now, you know, expanding their, their average age because of advances in medical technology into adulthood. Okay. Now, not everyone does necessarily that at a MedPeds. Um, MedPeds is um, a specialty that can be, you can apply to outpatient, you can apply to inpatient, you can apply to specialties, you can do combined specialties, you can do telehealth, you can work abroad and work, work in impoverished nations, do doctors without borders. It's pretty much Everyone has their own reasoning. I encourage you guys to go on residency websites, type in like UCLA MedPeds residency. That's not where I am, but you say MedPeds residency, you'll look at the residents and you'll hear a story about each of them and why they went into MedPeds. So if you are interested in the possibly going into MedPeds, I would encourage you to do that. But for the most part, it's a smaller specialty in comparison to a lot of other specialties. So um, it's not as well known and a lot of doctors don't even know about it. All right. Uh, Rebecca, I also want to go into peds, but a lot of people say it's hard mentally to see and treat sick children. What do you think? Um, yeah, you know, some people find it more difficult to treat children, but ultimately somebody has to do it. I mean, if you have difficulty, I, I personally can't see like animals in pain. That's what bugs me. So I could never be a veterinarian. You know, if it's something that you can't manage, then, you know, that's something you have to kind of work through. But, um, ultimately, you can get through it if you kind of expose yourself to it. You kind of learn to see what a sick child looks like and learn to just kind of see through it and see the good and, and, and help them, you know, to get better and feel better uh, over time and kind of know that the sick state hopefully is kind of a transient state that you can help them get out of. But I think it's totally, you know, uh, reasonable to say that, you know, you're a little scared. So I, I, I encourage you to go and go into Google, type in pediatricians near me, look at the list, go call the, their offices and say, hi, 
my name's blah, 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 blah. I'm interested in pediatrics and I want to shadow, is it available? And maybe 10 people you'll call and one of them will say, yeah, come through and you'll come through and you can get exposed to pediatrics and maybe it's something you'll be into. And if you go the first day and you hate it, maybe you say, okay, I'm not gonna do pediatrics, I'll do something else, okay? So, um, you know, it's tough to see sick kids, but ultimately, you know, uh, you want them to get better. So you gotta kind of fight through those inner emotions, right? Uh, what else? Could you please describe what your daily work life is like with your combined residency? Thank you. So basically as a med peds doc, every three months I go back and forth. So for three months, I'm a pediatrician, three months, I'm an adult doctor, three months, I'm a pediatrician, three months, I'm an adult doctor. And then when I graduate, I can just mix it all up constantly or do three on three off, whatever I want. Like I kind of create my job and create my schedule, which is something that's really cool about med peds. And a lot of specialties, you can do that too, right? Like ENT doctors see adults and kids, ER doctors see adults and kids general surgeons sometimes see adults and kids um, it just depends on how you want to kind of live your life out and, and do what you want to do um, so day in the life so let's say i'm on internal medicine because i'm on internal medicine now so i wake up at five or six walk my dog zeus i'll show you a picture of him later uh, then i go to eat some breakfast brush my teeth maybe take a shower go to the bathroom uh, put Zeus back to sleep, put the TV on for him, and then I go and I leave. So I leave around 6 a.m., drive to the hospital, get there around 6.37, and then I get sign out from the night resident, right? Because there's a doctor that has to be there at all times. So the night doctor is going to sign out to me and say, this is what happened to Mr. Jones. This is what happened to Mrs. Bobby. I took this imaging. I gave them this medication. They This happened, so they went to the ICU. They're no longer your patient, blah, 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 blah. And I say, okay, thank you very much. And I send that person home. And then I go see my patients for myself. I check on them, I get a baseline. So I gotta see where they start the day because maybe their, their clinical status will change during the day and I have to see where they started. Because if I can see where they started to where they're going, I can, might be able to better understand what's, what's happening to them hour to hour and minute to minute. Um, so I do that and then at 9 a.m., this is as a resident, um, the attending physician, my head doctor comes around and the, my head doctor rounds with the patients. I tell them what I think the plan should be. And the head doctor will say, okay, I agree or okay, I disagree. And then we do that for the patient. And then we go around to all of our patients and our team is capped at 15, but some doctors will say up to 25, 30 patients a day. So it just depends where you're working. And we do that. Um, and then I get lunch at 12 and then from like one to 7 p.m. I write notes um, about what happened during the patients for medical legal documentation and to remind myself the next day what I did the day before, because there's a lot of patients, a lot of things that are happening, right? Then I go uh, respond to rapid responses. If, if patients are, are decompensating and they need help, uh, I call families and update them. Uh, I transfer patients or I admit new patients to my floor that the ER is calling me about saying this patient needs to be in the hospital. And then at 7 p.m., the night guy or the night gal comes back and I sign up my patients to them and I do the same thing again. And that's an inpatient rotation. If I was an outpatient rotation, let's say I'm in peds, I wake up at 7, I go to the clinic and I see a patient every 15, 20 minutes, solve their problems and go home at 5 um, So it's a little different inpatient and outpatient. It's a different vibe. And usually people are one way or the other they prefer outpatient they prefer inpatient inpatients quick fast a lot of things outpatients can be also very really quick and fast but it's usually you're kind of solving one or two problems at a time and it's not uh, you don't have to treat like the whole patient every you know every time so um, i encourage you to shadow wherever you think you're going to be and uh, if you're considering a certain field of medicine think about what you're going to be doing right uh, and think about how many hours a day you're going to be working how many years of training you're going to need and maybe if you're going to go into that field and commit what 10 15 years to it you should probably shadow uh in that field right now so i i encourage you to shadow okay i know that pas have a lot of mobility in terms of their specialties what made you go to the md route yeah so i thought of pa initially i think pa is really cool so md is takes a lot a lot of years to do but you're kind of the specialist in your field you gotta you get to make your plan pas typically have to work underneath a doctor, um, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that because PAs, respiratory therapists, OT, uh, speech therapy, nurses, nurse practitioners, we're all in the same player. So we all want to help the patient. But ultimately, you know, the doctor just kind of oversees everyone and determines, okay, what's the plan? And the PAs essentially, you know, have to agree, disagree, and kind of work with the doctor to, to make that plan. 
Um, and a lot of times, you know, doctors can be very hands off and the PAs are making the plans and doing a lot of the work. And what's really cool about physician's assistant is they can go off and switch between specialties. So maybe one day I want to work in pulmonology uh, and do bronchoscopies. And one day I want to work as a gastroenterologist and do endoscopies and colonoscopies. And maybe one day I want to be an obstetrician gynecologist and help deliver babies. So that's what's really cool about PAs. You can just jump around. Nurse practitioner is kind of the same, but generally you do kind of stick in the field that you're in. So there's like nurse practitioning in pediatrics, adult medicine, family medicine. So it's usually you're more kind of constrained and nurse practitioners can um, in, in certain states practice alone. They don't need to work under a doctor. But ultimately, uh, you know, PA is a great route. NP is a great route as well. Doctors is a great route. Whatever you want to do, it's all the same. Um, uh, in terms of, you know, you're there for the patient, you're treating the patient, you're dealing with a lot of the same medicine. It's just that your education and your background and the way that you got there is, is generally different. And then at the end of the day, your kind of your power is a little bit different. Um, but if that doesn't bug you, then I totally encourage you to go through that route. Any other questions? Lindia and uh, Rebecca, you're welcome. Lindsay asked, do I work with PAs? Yeah, I do. It's more in the surgical specialties. They handle a lot of the medicine, the medicine of uh, the like non-surgical side of that the, uh, the surgeons are doing, at least at the hospital I work, but PAs are everywhere. Uh, sometimes they're also in our ER and they see patients all by themselves. They just talk to the attending and say, this is what I'm going to do. And the attending goes, okay, I agree. And the attending basically never sees the patient because the PA it maybe is well experienced. They've been doing it for a long time and basically they're pretty much good to go. Um, you know, I, I, I really stand by the fact that I don't think you need to be a, be like an Einstein to be a doctor or be a healthcare worker. I think you just need to care about your patients and be hard worker, have good time management and care about people and know how to interact with people. That's the most important thing. All right, Colin Sun, um, duh, you're welcome, Lindsay. Does the fellowship require state's residency? No, so you can, like if you're in the US, you can go from any residency to any fellowship. It doesn't, as long as it's a US fellowship. I know that there's like DO specific residencies too. I think that that does also doesn't matter. For example, one's residency in California, the fellowship doesn't matter. So yeah, no, it doesn't matter. You can you can jump around, but just, just remember, you know, I, I recommend you do your research as to where you're want to do your fellowship because a lot of times certain residencies prefer that they have their fellowship or for certain fellowships prefer that you do your residency there or they care about what program you were at if it's across the country, if it's more prestigious. So just keep that in mind. Rebecca, I'm thinking about doing pediatric nursing as of right now. Do you know what they're in charge of in a hospital? Uh, I, I in charge of. So pediatric nursing, if you're doing like an RN, which is like a registered nurse, you're like really, you have a few patients a day and you're taking care of them all day long, running their IVs, managing their diet, working with the MD. And you're like the first line of defense. You're like that frontline soldier that's telling us, doc, listen, I think there's something wrong with the patient. You should come take a look. Or doc, I noticed you put in this order and it doesn't look right. And guess what? We're humans too. We make mistakes all the day and nurses catch my mistakes like all the time. And like, you know, I'm super appreciative. And that's why we're all on the same playing field. Um, pediatric nurses can also work in the outpatient as well, um, in like the clinic and the office and what you're doing there is a little bit different. You're doing more vitals, you're doing intake, obviously you're not going to be doing IVs. Maybe you're doing like, you're doing vaccines, stuff like that. But Rebecca and Colin, if you guys have specific questions and all of you just, just add, please add me on Instagram and you guys can, don't have to ask me questions today. You can ask me questions in a year from now. I answer all questions on Instagram, like that my Instagram is literally to help you know, pre-med, pre-health students figure out what they're going to go into and answer questions. Um, you know, I am an MD, but it doesn't mean I don't know anything about NP, DO, PA, PT, OT. You know, I work with all these people, so I, I can at least put you in the right direction. So please take down my info and reach out so that you guys always have the, the availability to, um, to reach out to me. Um, Ava, Ava. Ava, I'm deciding between doctor and PA and a big factor that I'm thinking about is the work-life balance. Do you think the work-life balance of the doctor is as bad as people say, or do you still have time to do things you enjoy? You still have time to do things you enjoy. I mean, even as a resident, you have to keep in mind, med school is tough because you're always studying. Residency is tough because you're always working like six days a week, like 13, 14 hour work days. But when you graduate, you know, by that time you're like 30 on average, 30 something. 
you know, you can kind of make your own schedules. If you want to work part-time, you can, if you want to work one week on, one week off, you can do that. It's really all up to you. So it's totally doable. I mean, I, I have a dog, but you know, instead of going out and partying every week, I put my money towards having a dog walker to make sure he's walked. Cause he brings me happiness. I bring him happiness. He's a rescue. So, um, I, just really enjoy having him around and I feel like I'm giving back and I take a lot of happiness and love from him. So um, you can totally have a life outside and you can date. I, I dated a lot my, my first year of, uh, of residency. I dated in med school. It's totally doable. So totally, it's all about time management. So right now you guys need to be thinking about time management and, and how you're going to be figuring out your day-to-day -day plans. Cause ultimately if you don't learn how to do time management, there's no way you're going to get through school because there's so much stuff going on. So I, I recommend you guys make planners hour to hour every day what you're going to do and even make a plan for when you're going to like go out. OK, from nine to one a.m. on Thursday, I'm going to go out with my friends, because then once you make that block, your social day, your social time, you don't feel guilty about doing it because you know that the rest of that day or the rest of the time around that you guys studied. OK, Rebecca, you're welcome. Will Butler, how would you structure a plan for studying for the USMLE, USMLA, USMLE? So um, I would, if you can afford it, I would do one of those programs like Berkeley Review is one, Kaplan. I did Kaplan. I think Kaplan's fantastic. Um, if you can, um, if you can't do that, then I'll just tell you what resources I use for studying. Um, for step one, I would imagine if you're doing USMLE, then you must be in a medical school. So I would recommend doing, I just used first aid and Pathoma. And then I did U world questions. That's it. Limit in also guys for the MCAT, like limit your resources to one, two, three resources. Do not do more than that. Have one main book, one main question bank. That's it. And then everything in between, you'll just kind of fill with the other. Do not have like six books for one thing. It's just, it's just too much. And while you're going through the book, highlight what's important, because guess what? You're going to go back through that book again, and you're not going to want to read all the stuff that you already knew. So you're just going to read the highlighted stuff. So the first time through, highlight what you're doing. Time management, guys, be efficient. When do you think is a good time to start studying for the MCAT? I mean, I took a year off because I knew that, you know, I, I, first of all, I was doing two degrees and I was like super busy, but also like I wanted to get the best grades possible. That's what's most important for med school. So I'm not going to risk that. For me, I knew I couldn't do that while I was studying for other classes. So I took that year off and I decided to take the MCAT and I, you know, did happy enough that I thought I did. And, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't change that. So I recommend that for most people. If you're a brainiac, study for, you know, in your in your third or fourth year and take it then. You know, I, I know some really smart, smart, some some smart people who did that and, and they, you know, ended up okay and going to USMD schools, but I just wasn't on that, that kind of level. Um, I was always kind of an average Joe in my class and I needed to take that year off. So um, I think most people going into medical school are not like straight out of college. A lot of people take time off. They do a post back, they do a master's, whatever it may be. Um, so, you know, just, just keep that in mind, you know, uh, there's no rush. Don't pressure yourself. Just make sure you're doing the best you can. Um, and if you don't, and it, even if you do apply and you don't get it and you're going to just, just apply the next time um, and try again. Uh, but in that year, do something really big and different um, to up your application. And always apply USMD, USDO, and international. If you're too good for international, then I don't want you in my field. If, you all, if all you care about is prestige, then you, you don't deserve to be a doctor because you should be in it for the patients. You should be in it for the experience and you should be in it because you care about people, not because you need that USMD degree. Okay. Uh, one main book, one main question bank and a program. Thank you. Yep. Very good. More questions guys or no. Okay. So we can do the case if you want, we want to do the case. And if you guys have questions throughout, just, just put them in the chat and I'll answer. Do you guys want to do the case? Yay or nay? Give me a yay or nay guys. Yes. Yes. Okay. Ava put one up. All right. Um, did I, I don't think I sent you guys at socially distance the, um, the link to my, let me quit this. Let me open this up. I'm going to, I'm going to answer your question. What leadership volunteer clinical experience did you do using undergrad? So while I'm looking, I'm going to answer that. So personally, you can do whatever you want, but, um, uh, undergrad, I was in a fraternity and I did philanthropy chair. Um, I did some research with um, 
uh, with, with the psychology department because I was interested in that. As long as you're using the scientific, scientific method, I think it's like totally fine. You don't have to do like wet lab research. I think that's like so much overkill. Like just do something that you're interested in because you're like spending the time, you know, doing that. Um, what else? Let me see. I'm opening up the wrong thing here. Da, 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 da. Where is this guy? Um, and what other experience did I do in undergrad? Um, I mean, that's pretty much the gist of it. I did, um, I, I did work in undergrad as well. And I did, um, uh, you know, some, some work with my religious school and I worked with kids. So I guess that looked good. Cause I said, I wanted to do pediatrics. I volunteered at like a medical camp, look up medical camps around you. That's a really cool thing to look out for. I worked at a diabetes camp. I'm a type one diabetic. So I like was hooked into it already and it looked good. It was medical. It was volunteer um do you have like specific questions about what what opportunities you guys think you should be doing i'm still pulling this up my powerpoint is slow to load um okay so should i share my screen okay i'm gonna share my screen yeah i think uh, i have it enabled so that you can all right perfect so i'm gonna share my screen can you guys see yep, can you see good. yes uh, so play from start. Okay, so here's my lecture. I think I did a Q&A. Here's my dog, Zeus. He's sitting right next to me. I'll show you guys in a sec. I live in Long Island. I play a little guitar. I play some instruments. Ooh, that was another thing. I like, could say I play instruments, whatever. Um, this is where I work at Stony Brook Hospital in Long Island, New York. It's a big academic center, 600 beds, a lot of fun. I told you why. Did I tell you why I chose medicine? I'm a diabetic. I was in and out of the field, so I really enjoyed uh, medicine I didn't really know anything else and I you know each of you are going to have your own reason to go into medicine so I don't think that uh, it really matters as long as you're in it for patient care you're not in it for the money you're not in it for the prestige you're in it because you care about patients and you want to give back um, and you you know have good values um, so the National Med Peds Resident Association is a really good website to check out. Also the American Association of Family Practitioners, AAFP, to learn about different diseases and conditions. And it's like pretty like basically spelled out. So even pre-med students can learn about different conditions and like get exposed to like really cool opportunities, um, to learn about different fields of medicine. So AAFP and NAMPRA, N-M-P-R-A. Uh, I think I told you a little bit about what med peds docs do. Uh, here's a breakdown of basically what you guys will be doing. You have four years of your undergrad, four years of medical school where you'll have multiple USMLEs throughout, um, uh, a few years of residency, usually minimum three, it's not two. And then fellowship is usually one to two, three, four, five years. So you're looking at like a lot of years, right? At least like 12 years, 13 years of, uh, of schooling. So just keep that in mind. So if you're thinking about a certain field, certain specialty, you guys should definitely look up how long the process is going to be because you know you're going to be in it for a long time so keep that in mind uh when you're applying okay not all medical specialties are the same amount of time um if you have questions about this timeline reach out um so here's some med peds docs so here that's me on the left i'm a critical care i want to go to critical care um in the middle uh she wants to go in she is a a, a pediatric intensive care doctor the guy on the right, I don't remember exactly. And then the guy on the far right wants to go into med peds cardiology to follow um, cardiologic conditions from uh, birth to death, which is pretty cool. All right, we did some Q&A. We'll talk about a case. So this guy, 14-year-old guy, comes in for, um, he had fevers for like 20 days, which is kind of a long time. If you have a fever greater than seven days, you should have some concern. All right, um, he went to uh, a temperature of 103 maximum. He took Tylenol. Uh, it, it helped a little bit with the fever, but it's still persisting, obviously. Of note, he was in Pakistan recently, which is a pretty interesting uh, little piece of history that we should keep in mind. And uh, he also went to see a doctor. So he did, did went to go see a doctor a few days ago. And it looks like they swabbed him and he was positive for strep throat. So they gave him some antibiotics, but he's still here. So maybe they didn't. Maybe that's not what it was. Maybe it was a false positive test, right? Even the COVID tests are not always right. Even if they're positive or negative, they might not be either. Okay. So review of systems is what we do to make sure we're covering all our bases when we're asking questions. So other things that he mentioned to us where he had weakness, he had fatigue, he was tired, 
He lost some weight. He was sweating at night. He was coughing, nauseous, vomiting, diarrhea, and he was anorexic. Anorexia is different than anorexia nervosa, right? Anorexia is when you don't want to eat. Anorexia nervosa is a psychiatric condition in the Diagnostic Statistician's Manual, which is a psychiatric disease. And he had headache, all right? So he's, there's, these were his vital signs, okay? So his temperature was 38, pretty high temperature. Um, this is Celsius. So normally you don't want to be above 37.8 Celsius. So that's roughly 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit. Your heart rate as an adult, you know, we'll, we'll pretend like he's an adult, shouldn't be above 90, his was 116, it was elevated, but like even but babies can be at like 220 and that's normal. So you have to always think about the age that you're dealing with. And then his blood pressure was low. H means high, L means low to help you guys out. So his blood pressure was 80 over 50, which is very low. You want it to be around 120 over 90, 120 over 80, okay? And then pulse oximetry was 96, meaning, his blood was saturated with the oxygen to an adequate amount, okay? So on the physical exam, it was pretty normal. He generally looked well, his eyes were clear, no signs of conjunctivitis, his ears were clear, I didn't see any otitis. His nares were clear, his mouth looked clear, you know, his um, tonsils didn't look big, his throat wasn't erythematous, meaning it wasn't red. He felt his neck, he didn't have too many lymph nodes. His heart sounded good, there's no murmurs. I listened to his lungs. It didn't sound like he had pneumonia. Um, I, I felt his abdomen. It didn't seem like there was anything weird going on there. Um, and I looked at his skin and he seemed like he was acting appropriate. So it was a normal exam. So I was kind of confused. Any questions? All right, cool. If questions come up, um, McKenna, let me know because I can't see the chat right now for some reason. What's the medical term for what this patient is experiencing? Usually doctors are pretty clever in thinking of like medical terminology for what people are going through, but this one was pretty boring. Fever of unknown origin. That's pretty much what he had. We just didn't know how, what it was. And that's usually what we call it when they've had a fever for greater than eight days. Um, so there's a funny joke. Oh, you said F-U-O, not U-F-O. That's not that funny. What could be some of your differential diagnoses? Okay, this is what I want you guys to participate in. What do you guys think this guy could have? Rima said malaria. Question yeah, one. totally. We were thinking of malaria. That's correct. What else? Come on, people. Come on. There's no wrong answers. You guys are all pre-med. I don't expect any of you to get this answer right. So just guesses are going to be helpful because I, I just need to know you guys are alive, okay? Scarlet fever, bacterial infection, yes. like a parasitic infection. Parasite yes, yes, infection. yes. Very good. Good job. Good job. Those are all possibilities. Hundred percent. Good job, guys and gals. So this is just like one way to break down. You know, how do we classify kind of what areas this fever of unknown origin goes into? And you can do this for all sorts of ways people present for headache, for passing out, for chest pain. You can kind of break it up into different categories. So. They broke it up into an infections and then they broke that up into bacteria, viruses or something else like malaria, like fungus. They broke it up into malignancies like um, uh, lymphomas or leukemias. They broke it up into autoimmune conditions. They broke it up into maybe drugs or clots. So you always have to think about multiple things in multiple ways that a patient's presenting because usually the first thing that you go to could be correct, but it could also not be correct. And you want to make sure you're covering all your bases for your patient. So what would you like to do for this patient? He's got a fever. He's got a low blood pressure and um, he's tachycardic. What would you guys want to do? Again, I need participation. Participation. Come on. Quiet group. Oh my gosh, you guys. Come on. Somebody, somebody, come on. What do you want to do for him? Um, Will said, if it's bacterial, maybe prescribe antibiotics. Why yes. maybe antibiotics? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Misha said, PPE up. I don't know. Yeah, it could be COVID. You should PPE up. Heck yeah. Um, fluids. Yes, because he has low blood pressure. Fluids are the most important thing. Good job. What else? Uh, well said, was he sexually active while in Pakistan? If so, maybe it's viral. Okay, okay. Prescription drugs. 
Could be a drug fever. Yeah, could be. Drugs, yep. All right, so maybe we'll do a toxicology test to see what he's on. It was, it was normal, by the way. So um, before we decide that, we have to decide, okay, based on what, what we find, are we going to admit this guy to the hospital or are we going to send him home and like have him follow up with the doctor outpatient because it's not that severe? What do you guys think? Should we admit him or should we send him home and have him follow up with the doctor? Admit him from me admit. and everybody else in the chat so far. <laughs> Oh, admit. All right. So here are his labs. Okay. He had a low sodium. He had a high, he had a high glucose level, which can be a cause of a stress response. His creatinine was high, meaning he has low intravascular volume. So his kidneys are being damaged. ALT, AST are elevated, meaning his liver function tests are high, meaning his liver got damaged, usually from low intravascular volume in this case. Uh, most importantly, his white blood cell count at the top right was normal, which is weird because white blood cells typically go up or go down when you have an infection and his was normal. So, hmm. what else? If you look on the left, his C-reactive protein and procalcitonin, those are generic um, inflammatory markers, meaning there is inflammation going on in his body, but we don't know where it's coming from. It's just generic. So we know there's something up. And if you look at the right, it was a, it's a normal nasal swab. Um, to look for different viruses, which was all negative, including COVID-19. You guys know at the bottom, so COVID negative. Interesting. Should we believe this COVID-19 is negative after the first one? Maybe. Who knows? Well, what, what you might want to do is retest them because sometimes these tests are falsely negative. Okay. All right. Here's his chest x-ray. What do you guys think? And there's no wrong answers. We're all learning here. What do you guys think? Normal, does it look weird to you? Will said his lungs look clear. His lungs Normal, clear. so no pneumonia. Clear, looks good. A little fluid, question mark. A little it's fluid, a yeah, I think there was a little fluid. It was read as normal by the radiologist. So sometimes depending on how well the x-ray penetrates the thoracic cavity, it can look like there's certain things that are there, but the... Uh, uh, the radiologists have special tools to determine that. And they said that this looked normal, but yeah, I think there's a, there's a little fluid on either side of that, the heart there in the middle. So, but ultimately. Um, the is normal. Sorry. <laughs> Ava just asked if the white stuff was congestion. Yeah. So that can be a little bit of congestion and congestion means the, the pulmonary vasculature arteries, veins have a little bit of fluid in them. Um, and that's what congestion means. And that can be from a lot of different things, uh, like heart failure that can be from, uh, fluid in the lungs, et cetera. So I won't go down those pathways, but, um, it does look a little congested to me, but they read it normal. Okay. We talked about what we want to do this patient. We're getting fluids. We should give them antibiotics and Tylenol for fever. Okay. That's what we did. So we did, you guys were right. We want to admit this patient to the floors. And a big thing that we did was we took blood cultures and he waited and waited for days and days on the floor until finally the blood cultures grew something and it was salmonella. So salmonella is a bacteria and um, you can get it from certain foods, from contaminated water, from impoverished regions with poor sanitation like Pakistan, parts of Pakistan and interacting with certain animals. You get it more common as a kid uh, in, in adults, it's usually less clinical. It might not present as severely. And there's only like 200, 300 cases a year. So keep in mind, there's 6,000 hospitals. So it was kind of rare and cool to be able to see this case. A lot of people don't see this anymore. Um, so uh, I did a, you know, a report on this case and now I'm reporting it to you guys because I thought it was so interesting. Um, there are people that can chronically carry salmonella. If you've heard of Typhoid Mary, I recommend you look her up. It was a, a lady who... Uh, was a cook for a house and she basically didn't wash her hands well enough. She gave all of her patrons um, salmonella and she got fired and went from house to house giving all of these people salmonella. Interesting story. I would look it up. Um, uh, in Pakistan, you know, they throw around antibiotics quite a bit because the area uh, is impoverished. So they only have access to certain antibiotics at a time. And that means the bacteria learn how to fight those antibiotics because they keep getting exposed to them. So normally we treat, you know, this bug with a antibiotic called a fluoroquinolone, but um, we couldn't this time because it was coming from a region where this, this bacteria was um, resistant. 
So we had to think about something else. Uh, okay. So uh, if you look at the right, that's the, an image of what they look like under the microscope. They're gram negative bacilli, bacilli meaning like they're kind of like rod shaped. Um, so E. coli, if you guys have heard of it, also kind of looks like that under the microscope. So the way to determine what it is, there's different ways that you look under the microscope and apply different solutions to figure out exactly if it's E. coli, salmonella, enterobacter, different sorts of gram negative bacilli that you're trying to determine which one it is so you can pick pick which antibiotic you're going to give. So this one typically lasts like five to 21 days. So this guy comes like read the textbook 20 days he presented with and uh, it made a lot of sense. And that's and if you if it doesn't get treated, um, it can be really scary. It starts out with fevers, abdominal pain, and then it goes into your abdominal cavity tissue can like perforate, you can go into septic shock, have peritonitis and even die. So he was really close to that. Uh, if he hadn't come in, who knows what happened to him. Um, this is what like um, one cool physical exam find. You can see the kind of the red speckles around the chest. Um, it's a common sign of salmonella, but this person didn't have it, um, but it is an interesting finding. So different findings are, like I said, you know, the white blood cell kind of can go up or go down, right? Leukocytosis or leukopenia. You can have transaminitis, which is elevations in your liver function tests. And you can also have elevated inflammatory markers. So he had both of those, those two. You can also take um, cultures. That's really the only way to determine if somebody has salmonella. So you take it from their blood or from their stool or from their urine even, and you can grow it in culture. Uh, there's been newer kind of questions about vital tests or rapid antibody testing, but they don't work as well. The best way to do it is to culture it. Get a bite of that bacteria from some sort of specimen, put it in a plate, grow it and see how to treat it. Um, so as I said, you know, this guy came from a region where there's resistance, so we couldn't use our normal bugs and antibiotics. So what we did was we grew it on a plate. If you guys see, uh, let me see a good plate, that plate. So basically, if you look at this plate, each of those, so basically there's bacteria all over. That white stuff is the bacteria. And the circles are um, uh, different antibiotic, um, different antibiotics they placed. And if you look around the circles, there's empty space and whiteness, meaning that antibiotic killed that, that, that bacteria in that area. Um, meaning that, so that means that that antibiotic or rather that bacteria is sensitive to the antibiotic. So we can use that antibiotic to kill the bacterial infection. If it doesn't create a, a, an empty circle around then unfortunately it's resistant. So that's what happened in this case. It was resistant to what we normally treat it with. So we ended up treating it with a drug called Bactrim which is called sulfamethoxazole trimethorprine. We sent him home, which is an oral medication, right? He didn't need to be in the hospital anymore. We could send him on a pill. He went home and that was the end of that. Um, so he ended up being okay. He followed up with the infectious disease doctors and he's doing really well. So that's my presentation on salmonella. Uh, that's a picture of Zeus, a majestic picture of Zeus. Um, very cute dog in my objective opinion. Um, he's got a, an Instagram page as well. So if you wanna follow myself and him, I encourage you to do so. Um, if you guys have any questions at all, please, please, please reach out. Um, I, I, you know, it, what time is it now? We have a few minutes. Um, if McKenna wants me to answer any questions as well, um, if you guys have any more specific questions that came up. It's okay if there's no questions, no problem. So feel free to reach out on Instagram. I encourage you all to add me. There's 30, how many of you? 34 of you, I should get 34 friend requests and each of you should be answering uh, or rather asking me a question and I should be answering you by tonight, helping you out. Um, and if you guys don't answer, you know, have a question tonight, ask me tomorrow, ask me in a year. I live for this. My page exists for, you know, helping pre-med students out and even medical students and giving advice because I didn't have a lot of that. So I want to be available to you guys. Um, but most importantly, um, if I can really say anything is that there's so many jobs out there where you can make a difference in people's lives. And if this career doesn't work out for you, whether you decide you don't want it or um, you don't have the grades or you keep getting denied from school, it's totally fine. There's amazing career opportunities out there where you can make a difference in people's and animals' lives. Um, and you know, being a doctor is not the only way or being a PA is not the only way to make a positive difference in the world. In fact, I, I would argue that people who open animal shelters or feed the homeless, they're doing a lot more work than I am. They're, they're being more selfless than I am. 
because they're out there not getting paid uh, very much money at all, or if any, to help other people's lives. So that's really, in fact, more prestigious in my eyes than what I'm doing. I happen to enjoy what I'm doing and love what I'm doing, but it's a lot of hard work. It's not Grey's Anatomy. You know, you're not like walking down the hall all sexy every day. It's a lot of work sitting in an office, a lot of re repetition. So you guys have to keep that in mind um, that it's a really long journey. You have to really love what you're doing. So please go shadow. Um, it's okay to be, you know, anxious and have a little, feel a little bit of pressure, but don't put so much pressure on yourself. There's really more to life. Learn to be a human. You know, you're on this earth for so long. So just make sure you're living your life as well and, and um, you know, stay positive and, and again, reach out for any questions at all, okay? Awesome, and you were amazing and we're so glad that you were able to come and talk to us today. Like, thank you so much. Um, I'm going ahead and send in the chat the link to the Google form. So if you missed it at the beginning, um, if you want a live certificate for shadowing today, then go ahead and click that link. It should take you max three minutes to fill out and we will email that to you um, hopefully within the next week. So thank you all for joining us and thank you so much, Dr. Grossman, once again. It was fantastic to hear from you. Thank you so much for the opportunity and best of luck to you all. You guys are very welcome. You're very welcome. Please, please reach out. Uh, I'm here to answer your questions and best of luck to you all. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Let me get the Google link again and I will send that.